loved us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Today's scripture reading will be coming from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, excuse me, verses 1 through 6. And I will read in your hearing, and it reads, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. I have read to you Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and most of all, the doers of his word. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I am here for your church announcements, and they are as following. On Sundays, we have Sunday school at 9.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. At 11 o'clock, we start our morning worship. On Monday mornings, we have motivating moments, and that can be viewed at 8 a.m., and it's a special two-minute segment from our pastor. On Wednesday evenings, we have our Discipleship Academy from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. On, on the 14th, we will have our monthly prayer and service that we have every second Sunday, but this time it will start at 11 a.m. instead of 10.30. Also on the 14th at 2 o'clock p.m., our bishop will be the main speaker for the anniversary service of Gomez Temple. This will be a Zoom service and you will get directions on how to access the service. At this time, we will have our media announcements by Sister Camilla. Thank you for that introduction. Good morning, Abundant Love family and friends. I'm here to give you your media announcements and they go as following. At 9.30 and 10.30, you can find our Sunday School panel on Facebook at our Abundant Love page. And then Sunday, we have our 11 o'clock morning worship also on Facebook. And we have our motivating moments on Mondays at 8 o'clock a.m. And you can find that on Facebook. And everything that we do on Facebook is archived on YouTube. And you can find that at capital A, capital L, lowercase ministries. Thank you. That is your media announcements. Amen and praise the Lord. Amen and praise the Lord. Amen. Amen and praise the Lord. Truly, this is a blessed day. Yes. Hallelujah. In the house of the Lord. Amen. Our praise team is coming to glorify the Lord on this morning. They're coming to lift us up. Ah, what would the service be without the glorious voices of the Lord? Amen. Singing high praises unto him. Amen. 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 Don't clap your hands for the praise team as they come. Amen. Amen. Put your hands and praise you. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord everybody. Praise the Lord. How many glad to be in the house of the Lord on today? Hallelujah. 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 I was thinking this morning, it's been a year since this foolishness started, but we still here. Hallelujah. We still here. You're still alive. You're still breathing. So we come to praise him on this morning. Amen. Come on, put your hands together.
keeper of the soul. He's the keeper of my soul. He's the keeper of my soul. He is the keeper. says that he's able to keep whatever we commit to his trust and so I've just decided to commit myself to his trust how many know that the Lord is able to keep you look over at somebody and say the Lord is able to keep you amen be not dismayed whatever be tied the Lord will he will take care of you and I'm so glad that he's that kind of God. He's the kind of God that promises to care and take care of his own. In fact, he says that he will never leave us. He said that he would never forsake us. He said that he is with us always, even until the end of the age. Look at somebody say he's true to the end. Amen. He's a true God and we bless him today. Thank you for tuning in today and thank you the Lord for those of you that have come to worship this morning how many know that the Lord deserves all your worship and all your praise oh don't fool me this morning amen when they came to Jesus and they asked should they pay taxes he said bring me a coin and when he lifted the coin up he said whose superscription is on this coin they said Caesar's he said then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render to God the things that are God. How many know that praise and worship only belongs to God? Amen. Amen. We can compliment other people, but when you talk about the earnest of your soul, the earnest of your worship, it belongs to nobody but God. Amen. Amen. And that's what we've come to do today. We've come to give him the highest praise. Amen. I am Pastor Gary Bush. I'm delighted to have this opportunity. Uh, to share the word of the Lord with you. And I am grateful to have this opportunity again. Amen. This time last week, uh, I was on a bed of affliction. And the Bible, you know, is, is explicit about God's healing power. You will not find a verse in the Bible that promises you will not get sick. But you will find many verses that say he promises to heal you. And so many are the afflictions of the righteous. Sometimes the righteous have to go through some things. But thanks be unto God, he delivers them out of them all. Look at somebody say, God is a deliverer. Oh, yes, he is. He's a deliverer. He's, the, he's strong and mighty. And he's able to do uh, exceeding and abundant, the Bible says, above all that we are able to ask and think. So I stand uh, this morning much better than I did last week. I don't quite have all of my voice. You may have noticed that I've already taken that collar off and uh, just need a little room so that I can uh, do what I need to do this morning. Amen? Amen. All right, God bless you. Uh, we are here in a new month. The month of March is here already. Uh, it seems to me that this uh, year is already in full swing. Amen. Yeah, seems, yeah. It just seems like to me that January and February went by very rapidly. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, if we're going to get started and get anything done, the time is now to start and get things done. Amen. Amen. All right. Our theme for the month of March, we are a church that works from themes and throughout the month of March uh, we will teach and preach uh, from the theme 
endeavoring for unity. Can you say with me, endeavor, endeavor. For, unity. for unity. One more time, endeavor, endeavor. For, unity. for unity. And we found that, um, that particular theme in the book of Ephesians, Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. And we chose key verses, uh, verses three through six in chapter number four. That is Ephesians 4, verses 3 through 6. And I want to thank the praise team for such a wonderful job this morning. Amen. Perfect Peace is one of my favorite songs. And it is a testimony that the Lord will keep you at peace. If you keep your mind stayed on him. The enemy comes with many distractions, many traumatic experiences. And they are all designed to distract your attention from the goodness of the Lord. But if you can manage to keep your mind and your heart focused on the Lord Jesus and his word, the Bible promises that there is a peace that passes understanding. And when you operate in the peace that passes understanding, there are other people who will be looking at you in the trauma of your situation. And they will be wondering why you are still at peace and still that calm about it. And it is because it is a divine endowment from the Lord Jesus Christ so that you, can I say it like this? You really don't have to go off about anything. Yeah. Amen. You can trust God, and if you trust him, God will absolutely work it out in your favor. Yeah. Amen, somebody. Amen. Well, I didn't get enough amen, so I think I have to convince you a little more. It is Romans 8, 28 that says, we know. Now, this is not something we are guessing. This is something we are certain of. We are confident in the statement. We know that all things work together for the good of them that. Okay, now, now let me dissect that a little bit. It didn't say everything that happened to you was good. It just said that the thing that happened that isn't good is going to work with something that is good for your good. All things work together. By the time you get them all together, you're going to see the good from the hand of the Lord. If you're called according to his purpose and you love the Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. Let's get started here. Uh, shall not be long. Ephesians 4. I'm going to read verses 3, 4. Five and six. Stand to your feet with us as we honor God's word. I'm going to read from the King James Version of the Bible. Verse number three says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Verse number four says, There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in hope of one hope of your calling. Verse number five says one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Finally, verse number six says one God and father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. May the Lord bless his word. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. My theme simply this morning will be endeavor for unity. Can you say with me endeavor, endeavor. For, unity. for unity? Look at someone and say let's endeavor, let's endeavor. For, unity. for unity. If you can look at somebody else and say let's endeavor, let's endeavor. For, unity. for unity. As saints of God and believers in Jesus Christ, there is a place, there is a state called unity that exists in the Spirit of God. All throughout this fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians, Paul makes reference to an honored and elevated state 
that saints of God should operate. Not in our text today, but later on in the chapter, I think around verse 13, he says, till we all come into the unity of the faith. So there is a place, there is a state called unity that all believers, all people of God should not only aspire to, but we should operate in. Because in a state of unity, when everybody understands their part and performs their part, it makes it easier on all of the members in the fellowship. Are you with me today? So as saints of God, uh, we want to strive and move to this place called unity. That unity is a oneness. It is a fellowship, if you permit me to say. It is the feeling of togetherness. And this togetherness permits us to have harmony with God, with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And it also empowers us to have harmony with each other. I think in Acts 2 it says that all that believed had all things common. This state of unity allows us to have all things common. The benefits of unity and harmony are so valuable to the body that Paul exhorts us to endeavor to keep and maintain them. What Paul has said is once you reach this state and once you have arrived at this state and you get the benefits of this state of unity, you are to endeavor, that is, you are to strive hard to maintain the unity that's established in the Spirit of God. Endeavor by definition means just that. It means to try hard. It means to give maximum effort to achieve something. This unity is provided by God through his spirit, but it is maintained by us. Amen. Somebody said salvation is free, but the maintenance is high. And unity in the people of God is the free gift of God through the grace of God, but there is a responsibility that we have to maintain that unity that the Lord has provided. Amen. Amen. And so Paul instructs us uh, to try hard. He instructs us to give maximum effort to do all that is within our power to maintain the state of unity that is granted to us by the Spirit of God. We are to do everything within our power. In fact, the scripture says, as much as lieth within you, you are to work to live peaceably with each other. And that's what Paul says. He says that we are to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That is, this unity is maintained when we can keep peaceful relationships, peaceful re uh, resolution to issues and differences that we may have. Amen. You can say amen every now and then. Uh, God loves diversity. All you have to do is look around at creation. If God wanted us all to be exactly like him, he would have made us all look exactly like him. But isn't it remarkable that God made some of you all tall and some of us short? God made some of you all, uh, I won't say wide, I'll say thick, and some of us narrow. Isn't it remarkable that God didn't give us all brown eye color, but some of us are brown some are black, some are blue, and then some have those changeable hazel eyes. And, and so it is the variety that God has given us that gives us our individuality. But in the state of unity, there is a portion of your individuality that has to be sacrificed. It's got to be checked. It's got to be put in order and in place for the good of the whole. Amen. That state of unity is where we all get the best of what is offered to us. Bless his name. So, so the benefits of this unity and harmony are so valuable that God, uh, that Paul rather, exhorts us to work hard to maintain them. 
this Paul uh, instructs us to do our, our level best to work very hard to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. That is, this peace must be maintained, this unity must be maintained by, by the peaceful resolution of our issues and our difference. Can I be real today? When we come together in the church, we bring everything that concerns us into this church. And we only strive to be like Christ. So when individual differences and individual issues come up, and they will come up, Jesus said, uh, that offenses will come. We don't want them to come, but they do come. But it is the peaceful resolution. It is the godly resolution of differences and of issues that helps us to maintain the peace and the unity of the body. You can say amen every now and then. Amen. There is an unknown quote that says unity is strength. Division is weakness. And although the author of this quote is unknown, the principles of this quote are very well known by readers and believers in scripture. Because the Bible emphatically and repeatedly teaches that there is strength in unity and strength in agreement. Anytime you can bring, bring more than one person into the same mindset, unite them in a common cause, you have strengthened the effort towards that cause. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. There is strength in unity and there is strength in agreement. Too many places, but I did grab a couple today. And in Ecclesiastes 4, uh, verses 9 through 12, the wise King Solomon intimates to us what things we benefit from when we get together with one accord. Ecclesiastes 4 and 9 says two are better than one. It says they have a good reward for their labor. The first part of the 10th verse says for if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. Verse number 11 says, if they are cold, if they lie together, then they have heat. Amen. Verse number 12 says, and if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. Here the wise king Solomon tells us that the unity of two persons, I may say two or more persons, is better than one person alone. He says that two united have a better reward for their labor. You know, uh, earlier this week, uh, my brother went to work and I had an off day and I went to clean the house. And uh, I found out uh, that cleaning the house by yourself is no fun. It's good to have a partner when you get ready to do a job. The, the house still gets clean, but there's not so much wear on you as an individual. That's the principle that Solomon is saying here. He said, two people have a better reward. They have a better outcome from their investment when they work together in the same cause. He says that two united have a better reward for their work and for their labor. In unity, Solomon teaches that each have help from a partner when they fall. It's good to know that you don't have to fall, but it's better to know that when you fall, you got another hand, somebody who will bend over and give effort to get you back on your feet again. No man is an island. No man lives or dies to himself. You need somebody and you Need somebody associated and connected with you that wants your good. Never, can I throw this in there? Never get connected to people who only want your demise. But you want to connect. You want to be equally yoked with people that have your good at heart, that have your interest at heart. And when you get an ace, boom, cool, true to the heart, buddy, working with you, I said cool, boom, didn't I? I mean somebody who's down with you, committed to you. You say ride or die with you. Those are the 
are the people that will help you get things accomplished. And he says, if he falls, if he has some help, an associate, a partner, then he's got somebody to help him up. This is the one that just, it amazes me. Every time I read this, he says that if two of them are cold, if they lie together, both of them can get warm. Something about that concept just kind of messes with me because you can take two cold people and put two cold people together and instead of them magnifying the cold of each other, they will magnify the heat of each other and both of them will get warm Amen. if they can agree to lay together. It takes a state of unity for them to work together. Ain't nobody saying nothing in here. Then lastly, Solomon says that they have reinforcement and support in a fight. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've been in some fights where I knew uh, my opponent was stronger and faster than I was. And that's one of those times that I was glad I was born into a big family because if I had somebody that I knew I couldn't beat, I had three older brothers that I could run and say, hey, they're messing with me. And my brothers would come to my Thank you, thank you, Bobby, thank you. Let me take your time and thank you right now for every fight that you fought on my behalf. It means something to have something that when you're challenged in a place, somebody to come alongside and be supportive to you and help you and reinforce your chances of victory in the fight. That's why unity is good because unity allows everybody in the unity, in the fellowship to prosper. I, there are too many verses. I can't go to all of them, but Moses says in Deuteronomy that one of you shall chase a thousand and two of you shall put not 2,000, but 10,000 to flight. That means it's good to have somebody connected with you when you're trying to get something done. Jesus uh, continues to proclaim the advantages of unity. And he says this to us. He says, wherever two or three of you gather together, unify in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Jesus promises that if we can establish a state of unity in his name, that he'll come and be a willing member and a participant in the righteous thing that we're getting ready to do. That is, Jesus guarantees that he will be with us. And when we come together and unify in his name, yes, finally, I think the, the, the psalmist tied the bow on it all. When he looked at all those verses throughout the scriptures about how good it is to come together, he just said it like this. He said, behold, look how good and how pleasant it is when brethren get together in a state of unity. And there's something good that comes when we know how to get together. Look at somebody who said, we're in this together. Yes. We're in this together. Amen. We're not lone rangers, but uh, even the lone ranger had Tonto. Batman had Robin. Real good people understand that you can't do it by yourself, but it takes a network to get something done. I think the, that phone message that I had said it takes teamwork to make the dream work. It takes people that want to accomplish the same thing that you want to accomplish. And when you get to that state of unity, you start to experience all the benefits that comes from being connected. I think it was B.F. Skinner or one of those psychologists that talked about the we feeling. Something happens to you when you're looking at a group of people and not looking at them from the outside, but you feel like you're a part of it. The we feeling is what the state of unity gives, it, uh, gives to us. And then it's not their church, it's our church. And then it's not their progress, it's our progress. It's not their growth it's our growth. our growth I'm just trying to see if you're paying attention so so it is good it's good the psalmist said it's not only good it's pleasant it's pleasurable it's a desired place to be it is good you all know what I mean about places 
that you like to go. There are some places that we have to go we don't like to go. Amen. Amen. Okay, I got some heads nodding here. In a few days, uh, grass will be growing again. And I love a good manicured, good looking lawn. But can I just confess, I hate cutting grass. I don't like to cut grass. But I go and cut it because I like the results and the benefit of a cut grass. Oh, but there are some places I love to go. It's pleasant to go there. It's good to go there. And if it were just up to me and I could uh, be okay with the Lord, I would just stay there all the time. Amen. I love it when the grass is cut and everything is done. And then there are ribs and brats on the grill. And, and, and then... I love it when there's a lawn chair right there and a glass of lemonade all right. You know, you all, I'm just saying, pleasant means you want to be there. Yeah. That's what the psalmist has said. He has said that the state of unity for the people of God is not only good for us, good to us, but it is pleasant to us. It is desired. Can I say something to you? This social media and this social distancing is trying to break down the connection between people who are close. But if you really have good friends that you've connected with and you know what they like and they know what you like, if you really got good friends that you didn't have a good party with and a good fight with and then you're still friends, if you got the kind of friend that's been with you when you're on the mountain and stuck with you when you're down in the valley, you understand how good that realm of fellowship is. And that's the realm that God is encouraging us, that Paul is encouraging us to reach and strive, endeavor to maintain that realm that God has given to us. Let me get to the text here so I can go home. In Ephesians 4, Paul begins in verse number 1 and 2 by exhorting us to walk worthy of the vocation that we are called in. That is, we didn't make up our own mind to come into this but God in his divine providence, seeing you where you were, loved you enough and said, I need you to come away from there and come into what I've called you to. We were called out of darkness into the marvelous light. And so since we are in this light, we are to walk worthy. That is, we are to walk in such a way that we glorify the greatness and the goodness of God. We're to walk in such a way that we demonstrate the greatness of God. We shouldn't have the people thinking that God is mad at them with his whip held back, ready to pop them at the next thing they do wrong. We ought to teach them that God is a loving God. And no matter where you are or what you've been in or what you come through, he loves you and wants a better state of life for you. And so we are to walk worthy of this vocation. It is a vocation of righteousness and a vocation of holiness. And then Paul exhorts us not to get the big head. He said you ought to walk with humility and walk with all lowliness. You ought to always keep perched in your mind, but for the grace of God, there go I. Because you need to understand, you see some people doing some very damnable things, but it, if it wasn't for God's grace, you could be doing the same thing. And so when God touches your life, when God lifts you up, you don't get the big head, but you have an attitude of gratitude for what God has done for you. And with this attitude of gratitude, Paul then says that we should walk in humility as we represent Christ. He then tells us to earnestly endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit. Unity by definition is believers coming together in a common cause. It is working for a common purpose. It is combining action to, combine, to achieve that purpose. That is unity is God's desire. It is God's order for his people. Unity is God's strategy. It is his methodology for spreading the kingdom of God. Yes, God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit all work together in complete harmony. They never have a disagreement. They always want to do 
the same thing. They always put all of their efforts and all of their passion into doing the same thing. Yes, God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit all work together in complete unity and harmony. In fact, that unity and harmony is so complete that the Apostle John says to us that these three are one. They are of one mind and they can't be changed. It, can you imagine being with anybody that you never disagree with? Can you imagine being with somebody that they always want to go where you want to go? Yeah, you're just like me. Just keep on dreaming because the only person that's going to fulfill that is the Lord Jesus. And it's going to be being on this side. <laughs> being on this side. And so... And so God uh, has this desire for unity and order for his people. These three are one and they are so much one that they agree in every place. And then the prophet Amos poses this rhetorical question to us. He says, can two walk together except they be agreed? That is, unity and oneness then is achieved when agreement upon purpose is reached, you are unified when you have a purpose that you all agree on. How many know the only thing we agree on here is to glorify God? Amen. We don't want to glorify a building. We don't want to glorify a pastor. We don't want to glorify a choir or a music ministry. We want to glorify God and the power of his word. I should have got a stronger amen than that. Yes, can two walk together, except they be agreed. So oneness and unity is achieved when you come to agreement and purpose. And then it is solidified when the action of those united follows the pursuit of that purpose. So here, here it is. First of all, you have to hear what God is saying. And then you have to accept what God is saying. And then when you accept what God is saying, you all agree that God's word has the priority. And after that agreement, everybody started working for what God said. And when you find people united working to please God, you will find an atmosphere of growth. You'll find an atmosphere of victory. You'll find an atmosphere of celebration. Because that's what unity brings. Amen, somebody. So as we look at the words of our text and we look at the verses of our text, I'll take them in reverse. And the reason I'm taking them in reverse, because you will see the hierarchy in the reverse uh, of our verses. And so we know that God is the greatest. We know that Jesus is right under him. We know the Holy Spirit is right under him. And then we know the church has been instituted. And incidentally, when you look at these verses, they have taken the importance and reversed the importance. And so they talk about the body first. Then they talk about the spirit. Then they talk about the son. Then they talk about the father. But I just thought it wouldn't be right to talk about the body first if you don't talk about the father who made the body. So I want to take the verses in reverse. Is that all right? In verse number six, it says that God is one and he's supreme. Not only is God one, but he's above all and through all and in you all. He is supreme. There's nobody to be compared to God. And God is so great that he is in a class by himself. And he himself is one in purpose. In fact, his name means that he is the self-existent and self-sufficient one. God needs nobody to exist because he's God Amen. by himself. When he could swear by no greater, can you imagine looking around for something greater than yourself to make your word good? The Bible says he looked around and when he couldn't find anything greater, he swore by himself that his word was true. And so God is one. He is supreme. Then in verse number five, it says one Lord and that one Lord is Jesus Christ. Look at someone say Jesus is Lord. Ah, uh, not Buddha, Jesus is Lord. Ah, uh, not Muhammad, Jesus is Lord. Neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus is the way. He said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm
I'm the life. No man, nobody can come to the Father. I'm trying to calm down, but something about talking about Jesus just excites me all over. He said, nobody can get, nobody can get to the Father except by me. In fact, he said, if you get up there, I don't think you're going to get up there. But he said, if you get up there any other way, you are a thief and you are a robber. Look at somebody say, Jesus is the way. Yes, one God and Father and one Lord. That one Lord is Jesus Christ. That's what verse number five tells us. And then in verse number four, it tells us that there is one spirit. And don't mistake this, that's capital S. There are a lot of spirits in us as people because we are triune beings like God. That is, we have a body, we have a spirit, and we have a soul. But anytime you see capital S in the scripture, it's talking about the third person of the Trinity. It's talking about, people say, the Holy Spirit. But the Spirit is nothing but a ghost. It's something without matter, without tangible touch, but it's still as real as we are sitting here. So we got one Father. We got one Lord and Savior, one Son. We have one Spirit, and that Spirit and that, that Lord and that Father, they are all one. They all agree. They all agree. But see, here's the problem. The problem is they brought us along, and they got to bring us. <laughs> they got to bring <laughs> They got to bring us into agreement. Have you ever had a group of people and asked them where they wanted to eat? How many times did everybody say the same place? Have you ever, especially children, had a group of children and asked them where they wanted to go? Did you ever get a unanimous answer about all children wanting to go the same place? Oh, I, I thought about it. I got tickled just then. Uh, uh, last year, when I went out of town, just in January last year, 2020, I traveled to L.A. and I went there for a wedding. And when I got back from the wedding, I got home and my grandchildren, they were in my bedroom and they were playing having a good time so when I walked in uh, Harmony looked up and see me and said Paw Paw let's go to Chuck E. Cheese not a high not a high been, not a what you doing she just looked up and said Paw Paw let's go to Chuck E. Cheese I said hi Harmony how are you about that time Grayson looked up and said no let's go over to Uncle Bubba's house that's Pastor Lester Bush I said no hi hi I'm here hi how you doing and then uh, at least G3 made me feel a little better but then he said Paw Paw you be gone too long you need to come home <laughs> You never get the same answer when you deal with a crowd of people. And so the Father is one. The Son is one. The Spirit is one. And now the challenge is to make all of us one. The challenge is to bring all of us into the state of unity where we mind the same things and want to glorify the same God and want to do the work that he's assigned to our hands. So look at somebody say endeavor. For unity. for unity. That is, we have to try our hardest. We have to try very, very hard to come into the place where we all agree that God is God and we will follow him. Yes, I know Paul said follow me, but he said follow me as I follow Christ. That is a limit. That means that if Paul ever stops following Christ, stop following Paul. Keep following the Lord. And I want you to know in this day and time where people are writing their own Bibles, making their own translation, and coming up with their own set of rules for what it takes to be with God, I think that we need to stay with the scriptures. I need, I, I do believe that we should keep it just like it's written. I believe we should keep every book every chapter, every verse just like it is. I don't think we have to go into our mind and to our imagination to interpret what it says. I believe that the scriptures interpret themselves. I don't think God is confused. I think God said just what he meant and meant just what he said. And then it's our job to come to the place where we understand what he said so we can pursue what he said. Look at somebody say, endeavor, endeavor. for unity. For unity. Uh -huh, I got to close this. And so in the 17th chapter 
of St. John, just before Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross and to lose his life. And the Bible says, having loved his own, he loved them unto the end. And the Bible talks about how he went into the garden and he prayed so hard that sweat started to fall like great drops of blood because he was in such anguish and such, such bitter intensity about the plan of God and about his assignment. And he started to pray to God. He said, look, Father, if there's any other way we can do this if it's possible to do this and let the cup pass from me let this cup pass and you know he had a couple of disciples with him and he went back and expected them to be praying and when he got there they were on their backs and laying on their sides and they were sleeping I don't know what he did to wake them up he may have uh, just said something to them he may have shaken them he may have taken his foot and given a little nudge and said wake up here my soul is in anguish right now. Can you pray with me one hour? And the Bible says he went back and started to pray again and say, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me because the anguish of death, the anguish of being without God because God had to forsake Jesus long enough for him to die. You have to understand that Jesus is an eternal being and that he had never been out of fellowship with God. There was never a time in his life that he didn't have the presence of his father. There was never a time where God was not present. Every time Jesus looked to do something, God was right there. And so he had never experienced uh, never had the opportunity to be out of the presence of God and, and when the idea of dying on the cross for our sins, when the idea of becoming sin so that God could be satisfied he knew that it meant there would be a period of time where I need to be separated from God and that thought, not physical death but spiritual death is the thing that had him up in arms about giving his life on the cross and he started praying again and said father if it's possible let this cup pass from me and I believe that God said to him that's our plan that's the plan we made and we got to stick with our plan and when Jesus surrendered himself when Jesus surrendered his individuality and his wanting to live in the flesh unto the will of God he said nevertheless not as I will but thy will be done. And that's what has to happen when we come to the place of unity. We have to surrender our individuality into the will of God. And in the 17th chapter of St. John, Jesus was praying. And I want you to understand something. Jesus knew that he was at the end of his life. He knew that the mob was coming to get him. He knew that he had to die on the cross. And he knew he was going in the grave. And so while he's making this prayer, only the important things made this prayer. Y'all don't hear me today because sometimes we get down to pray and we pray about frivolous stuff. I want a new dress. I want a new pair of shoes. Father, will you bless me to get the best price when I go to the grocery store? And that's frivolous stuff because the Bible says take no thought what you shall eat, what you shall drink, or wherewithal you shall be clothed. Your Father knows you have need of those things even before you ask Him. But there are times in our lives when we have to come up with an emergency prayer. When somebody hits your car, the emergency prayer. And Lord have mercy. When you get sick and the medicine don't work, the emergency prayer. And Lord help me. Yes, Lord. I want you to know that Jesus was praying. 
uh, an emergency prayer uh, when he was in the garden. Uh, and in that prayer, uh, he prayed to the Father, uh, prayed about his death, uh, prayed about his mission, uh, and he prayed for us. Uh, and this is what he prayed. Uh, Father, Father, those that believe, uh, and receive those that will come out of the world and be your children. Here's what I want. I want you to do, Father, make them one like we are one. Make them one like we are one. If you make them one, they'll be one with the Spirit. And if they're one with the Spirit, they'll be one with the Son. And if they're one with the Son, they'll be one with the Father. One body, the body of Christ. One body, the bride of Christ. One body. Yes, Lord. One Spirit. One Lord. One baptism. One Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It's the plan. It's the desire of God that we be unified as one. Because when we are one, there is nothing that can be withheld from us. Let me help you. Which is why the enemy works so hard to divide the people of God. He knows he's a defeated foe. We just need to know it. Because he comes to steal. He comes to kill. He comes to destroy. He comes to steal the benefits that come from being together. He comes to kill your influence for the kingdom of God. And then he comes to destroy your growth and well-being in God. But you need to know that greater is he that is in me than he that is in. He that's in me. You need to understand that we're victorious. And as long as we stay together, as long as we stay together, nothing can defeat us. Anything that you don't pay attention to will dissolve. Some things have upkeep. Some things have maintenance. I found, as I close, I found a quote from Dave Ramsey earlier this week. I've been pondering it ever since I read it. And the quote says this. It says, working is doing it. Discipline is doing it every day. But diligence is doing it well every day. So it's not just enough for us to do it. Not just enough for us to do it every day. But when it comes to unity of the body, we got to be diligent at it. Especially in this challenging time. Because many people can't make it to the fellowship and we have to be ingenious in our ways to touch them and stay connected with them so that the unity of the body is not broken. What do you think Jesus did? Jesus said, I need to keep these fellas together. I'm going away. While I was here, he said, I kept you while I was here. But I'm going away, but I want you to understand something. It's expedient. It's good for you that I go away because when I go away, I'm going to pray the Father. I'm not just going away. I'm going to the throne room. I got a request that I want to make of the Father that's going to benefit you. He said, I'm going to pray the Father, and the Father is going to send you another comforter. And we always look at the word comforter.
for that someone to come along with compassion and pet you up and make you feel better. But really the root of the word comforter means strengthen. Amen. I'm going to send you a strengthener, someone to come alongside and help you do what's been assigned to your hands. And that Holy Spirit will abide, get this, with each of you forever. Isn't it good that the Holy Ghost can go home with all of us? Because we would come in here and worship and then fight over who the Holy Ghost going home with. No, he's going home with me this week. You had him last week. Because we know the benefit of how good he is. There's something wrong with you if you don't want the Holy Ghost in your house. But because he's omnipresent, he can be with all of us at the same time. That's why we have to endeavor. Watch this. Endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit. We don't establish where the unity is. The spirit establishes it. And we are to be people led by the spirit of God. And if we are led by the spirit of God, here's what it says. It says as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons and the daughters of God. This pandemic, bow your heads with me, I'm done. I gave you all I had. I want you to understand something. That the enemy works in many ways to divide the people of God. And I don't know, people have been asking me, do you think this pandemic is from God or do you think it's the devil's work? Here's what I said to him. I said, if it's the devil's work, he had to get permission to let it, done, let it be done. Because the devil can't act on his own. He has to have permission. So if God allowed it, and it seems to be allowed because it's here, I believe there's a message in it. God never does anything without purpose. And so I started asking God, what is the purpose of this pandemic? You know, I had to change my prayer. Because I was praying, Lord, take this away. Lord, get this off of us. Lord, let us go back to what we've been doing. And then the Holy Ghost posed the question to me. He said, what if I don't want you to go back to what you were doing? What if I'm trying to move you to another place? Because people have identified the presence of God with the house of God. But you better understand that the presence of God is outside of this building. And it's not something that you come in and out of two or three times a week, but it is something that you're supposed to dwell in and walk in every day. Here's what the Lord said to me. He said, this pandemic is to increase the tenacity of your adoration for me. I said, Lord, them is big words. Can you break it down to me so I'll make sure I got it? He said, adoration is your love for me. He said, tenacity refers to the intensity of it. He said, I have brought this so that people can examine and strengthen the intensity of their love for me. Because I know you love me on Sunday when you can get to the house, but house of the Lord, but do you love me when the pandemic say you can't come? Are you still dutiful to prayer when you can't have somebody pray to you or pray for you or pray over you? Are you studious to the word of the Lord when you're not in Sunday school, when the preacher is not preaching? Jesus said, if you love me, keep. And he said that I'm going to try them to see if they really love me. It set me back on my heels because then I started to look at my own walk. Can I love you more? Can I walk closer to you? Can I please you more? 
All of my answers were yes. And so you have to endeavor. You got to try, not just try. You got to try hard. You got to pull out all the stops. You got to stay in the presence of God without the company of your believers ushering you in. Because you know, can I say something to you that people won't say to you? It's easy to feel God at church with a whole lot of folk that love God around you. Yeah. It's tougher to feel God at work when nobody's saved but you. But God doesn't change by the company of people that you are surrounded by. God only changes by the level of faith that you have to believe he's who he is. And so the same God of the mountain is the God of the valley. The same God of plenty is the same God of scarcity. He says, I'm the Lord. I don't change. Because God doesn't change, we ought to strive, endeavor to stay in his presence and be one with him. Bow your heads, I'm done. My prayer is that this message challenged you this morning. And it is a challenge now because with the physical church so scattered because of the pandemic and social distancing and it's, it's been torture for us because we are a handshaking, hugging, touchy type of people and while we want to respect the health and the wealth and the well-being of our partner kind of puts us in a strain because we are people of close contact. We love each other. Because we love each other, it's been a challenge to remain close under a new paradigm. My prayer is that God will remove this pandemic, but I am praying that what God brings us back to is not the old, stagnant, routine way of having church and doing things. I'm praying that God will use this to organize the intense, tenacious lovers and worshipers of God to come together closer, to take more priority in his assignment, and to work with all our might to get it done. The day is spent summer has ended and still there are people who don't know the Lord and are not saved the Lord is saying to us go into the highways go into the hedges and compel them to come this is not the time to give up on people and say they're never going to change this is the time to go back with the anointing of God and to say to them it's time to know the Lord it's time for us as the people of God, can I say this? To kill the small foxes that want to destroy our vine. It's time to close the mouth of the gossiper and the gainsayer and the hater of the things of God. It's time now to establish the Lord strong and mighty. Say like the saints of old said, for God I'll live. And for God, I'll die. If you don't know the Lord today in the pardon of your sins, the Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that he died for your sins and that God raised him from the dead. The Bible says if you confess your faults, your sins, and believe in Jesus, you shall be saved. Then after you are saved, he said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. It's not just enough to say I'm saved. You got to get into that word. You got to find your pastor, find your instructor who's assigned and anointed to feed you with knowledge and with understanding so that you can grow thereby. Then as you grow, we're all growing towards the same place called unity of the faith and when we're unified in the faith believing the word of God we pursue the assignment that God has given us and we expect nothing but victory so I encourage you today endeavor stay connected 
Don't just look at Facebook. Text your neighbor. Text your sister. Text your brother. Don't just text. Call them. I got I got a little encouraging text that I send out every day to a few people. And one of the persons, pastor, that I send it to, I noticed that one day the pastor didn't respond. And I said, well, that's not like them not to respond to my text. And after a few minutes later, the phone rang. And it was pastor. And pastor said, I know we text every day, but I just wanted to hear your voice today. And when I thought about it, texting is too easy. Call your neighbor. Call your sister. Call your brother. The one you haven't seen for a while. Be concerned. Be compassionate. Find out what's going on with them. Endeavor to keep people connected as I close. It's too easy to cut people loose. The easy, now, don't get me wrong. There, sometimes people need to be cut loose. But the Bible does tell us that we're to be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to anchor. So, don't cut them off so quick. You got to strive to stay connected. By staying connected, the anointing can flow from heart to heart, breast to breast, so we can maintain that place of unity. We want to be one. We want to be one with God. And we want to be one with each other. Bow your heads. Let's pray here. An old song that Danabelle Hall sang said, what can I do, Lord, to be of service to you? How can I be pleasing in your sight? She says, this is what I'll do. I'll give everything I have to show the world that I love you and how good you've been to me. So, so wherever you are, I want you to make a conscious decision that I'm going to fight hard to stay connected to God and to stay connected to the people of God. It's one thing to stay connected to God, but you got to stay connected to God's people. Pastor, why do we have to do that? Because God is not coming back to get us one by one in the rapture of the church. He's going to take us as a group. Paul said to the Thessalonian church, I don't want you to think those that have died first are going to prohibit anybody that's alive from going. The Lord himself is going to descend with a shout. The dead are going to rise first. But they're not going away without us. They got to wait till we get there. We which are alive, we're going to be caught up with them. Meet them in the end. And then so shall we ever. Not me ever. We ever. Be with the Lord. And so you have to get unified here. We've got to surrender. We've got to surrender, surrender some of our personal agenda and assignment. You gotta make room for God. If you make room for God, God will make room for you. Father, in the name, the matchless name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the unity that you've given the body through your spirit. We thank you for the benefits. We thank you for the power that comes from being connected. We thank you for the anointing that flows through us. We thank you, Lord, for your power and your ability that moves in us to perform and accomplish the will of God. My prayer, Father God, is that you would help us to see how important it is that you would help us to realize how beneficial it is to us so that we do all that is in our power to keep the unity of the faith. Keep us in your will. Teach us to settle our differences in a Christian manner. Teach us, Lord, to forgive and to be forgiven so that the unity and the power of the body can be maintained. We love you and we bless you. We give your name thanks. In Jesus' name, the Lord's people said, thank God. Amen. 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 And amen. amen. God bless you and have a wonderful afternoon.